the Roddenberry Vault. This is episode 26. You're listening to 70s Trek with Bob Turner and Kelly Casco. The fan podcast that looks at Star Trek in the 1970s. It was the decade that built a franchise. Welcome to 70s Trek. This is the show that looks at all things Trek related during the 70s and sometimes a little beyond that. Like this week, I'm Bob Turner. And I'm Kelly Castro. You're right, Bob. This week, we step out of the show's format just a little bit and talk about the Roddenberry Vault. It's a collection of never-before-seen footage from the original series. And there are some really neat things in this collection, too. But let's tell listeners first how to find us. Kelly? Sure. You can visit our Facebook page. Just type in facebook.com slash 70s Trek. We hope you'll leave a comment or even a question. You can also find 70s Trek on iTunes. Just search 70s Trek in the podcast area. We also hope you'll leave us a rating or a review. You know, that helps others find the show. In December 2016, CBS video released the Roddenberry Vault. It's a collection of never-before-seen footage, as Kelly mentioned, from the production of Star Trek. You know, what's so amazing about this release is that it comes 50 years after the series premiered. You know, and, and we as fans and the public thought we'd seen all there was to see about the original series, but... I guess not. I guess not. I guess not. So the set includes three discs. There's 12 episodes on the discs and a three part documentary called inside the Roddenberry vault. Uh, there are two other documentaries and a collection of forgotten snippets, scenes, uh, whatever that have not been seen since they were viewed by the producers in the sixties. So let's give a little backstory here about this collection. Back in episode 12 of seventies Trek, we talked about how Gene Roddenberry saved All of this extra film and this stuff off the cutting room floor uh, and also work prints. And he put them away and he was saving them. Some stuff he sold through Lincoln Enterprises, other things he just saved. And uh, um, apparently as this collection grew, he got himself a storage area adjacent to where his wife's company, Lincoln Enterprises, operated. And in fact... In one of the documentaries, his son Rod talks about wandering into this room as a kid and seeing all of these shelves with hundreds or thousands of film canisters. But nobody did anything with this stuff until 2007. Can can you imagine that? No. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Well, that's when Rod invited Mike and Denise Akuda to come in and go through all of these reels to see what they had. And they were just blown away by what they found. It took them 10 years to catalog everything. Wow. 10 years. And they had so much great stuff that CBS video decided to release it on a DVD compilation. Yeah. This footage gives you a glimpse into what was happening behind the scenes as well as how some stories evolved and changed. In fact, There's some direct evidence of that, and we'll talk about it here during this episode. So, Bob, let's let's talk about some of the things we saw in the documentaries. Okay. You know, let's start with the Corbomite maneuver. Good place to start. Good place to start. They had a few of these um, omitted scenes, deleted scenes or omitted dialogue. You know, there was one between Kirk and Sulu. Do you you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah, about... um, Sulu's talking about Fu Manchu movies. Yes. I mean, Kirk says something like, you know, you're not a very discerning Oriental. And, and Sulu goes on to say, well, you know, I used to watch these old, what are they called? Oh, yes, films. And I would see, you know, these stereotypical Japanese actors and I would try to m- make my face mimic what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, I did. I'm watching Sulu do this, and I was kind of like, "Wow, that really doesn't make any sense." And I really understand why they left it out. But yeah. I, I guess what Roddenberry, and this is what the documentary says, what Roddenberry was trying to do was show that there isn't any more stereotypes in the future. It just sort of was clumsy, though. Yeah, it was, it was clumsy. But, I mean, the idea was good. I mean, it's always that bright future that uh, Roddenberry was trying to portray. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Arena, too. You know, there were so many good shots of the Gorn and, and of, the, uh, of the costume for the Gorn, that behind-the-scene oh, stuff. That Gorn costume was just really cool looking. And, and and maybe it's because we're fans and we grew up with it. You know, my kids look at the Gorn costume and go, <laughs> "Yeah, <laughs> that's stupid looking." <laughs> I look at that thing and I go, "That's awesome." But then I guess you know we we accepted it, you know, as kids, and so it's just there with us. Um, well, and and they they even said it in the um in the documentary, you know, that nobody had really seen this hybrid of like a lizard or a or a dinosaur and a human yeah and a human right and so there's the gorn walking around in a wetsuit basically or a modified wetsuit you know i i also like there was a deleted scene uh after they beam down after their the initial attack and it's uh Kirk and Spock, and they're talking about well who sent the message i'm not sure i don't have enough data to the to guess who sent the message you know what was it, about 15, 20 seconds? Yeah. Just a neat little look, though, into, you know, speculation that they would have. You can agree with me if you want. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I thought was cool, too, was when they beam down to that planet, it's the same set that they used to film the Alamo. I had no idea. I didn't know that either. No. And it was, it must have been... Um, well, it was, they said it was originally built in the thirties. Yeah. Yeah. And so it must've been originally built for something else. They didn't talk about it and I didn't research it enough. No, I didn't. Um, even, I but I thought that was cool. They used the Alamo with John Wayne. Yeah. In the sets. Yeah. And uh, then there's the iconic Vasquez rocks. Oh man. And how about some of those scenes too? There was a great alternative angle or, or alternative dialogue with Shatner as he's holding that, that sharpened rock to the Gorn's throat. Yes. A um, little different reading by Shatner than when we got in the finished episode. Still the same words, but he kind of took a different take with them. And that was neat to see. It was. Especially, you know, how many times have we seen it? So you have the original finished product flowing through your mind. And then to see Shatner saying the words in a different way, it's, it's almost, uh, it, it was a bit... Uncomfortable almost. Yes, yes. In this episode, how they talked about, and I'm sorry, Bob, um, but they talked about how most shows, how they a show kind of builds and builds and builds and es- keeps escalating, where Star Trek kind of does that, but then they kind of de-escalate, as they said. Um, and, you know, that's basically like it in the Gorn. He's got the sharp thing to the Gorn. And, no, right. I'm not going to do it. Right. Yeah, the climb. The climax of that episode, obviously, is when he fires the cannon and the Gorgon goes down. And you think, okay, he's got that sharpened rock and he's going to shove it in his throat. And he de-escalates, like you said. Yeah, you're right. There are a lot of episodes like that. Yes. I was going to say, let's go to Space Seed. There is a great moment uh, uh, that the uh, collection shows of Ricardo Montalbaum before he begins to give his lines. And he's yes, he's kind of flexing his facial muscles, you know, and he's getting his his, I guess, mouth muscles, you know, where he wants them to be. So he's, and he's preparing to give the line and it's, it's what, about two or three seconds. It's, it's a very short clip, but you kind of get some insight into that guy in those three seconds. Very interesting because you see then, you see him putting on the mask of Khan, I guess, as he's preparing his face. Because at the end of that shot, he is Khan. Right. And then they even uh, Shatner is on it and he's even talking about how he just loves watching um, Ricardo, you know, just do anything, anything in his career, dancing, acting, whatever. He just has been 
enthralled by him. Pretty neat scene, I thought. Um, there's a deleted scene of Khan and MacGyver's in the transporter room. It, just a couple of seconds of are you with me kind of thing. But the scene I really liked that was deleted was in the auxiliary control room after Khan had taken the ship. And McCoy says, hey, damn it, you know, you owe me because I saved your life. And somebody hits McCoy in the back of the head. <laughs> and then he says to Spock, you know, um, won't you? He's basically trying to win Spock over. Won't you join me? And Spock says something like, the only thing that I'll say is or, or comment on is the way you took over the ship. Brilliant. Whoa. Yeah. And that... I can see why they cut that. I mean, it's classic Spock. If you know Spock, you understand why he said it. But I can also understand why they cut it. Because for somebody who doesn't know the character well, you might think, is he pro-con? Did he become, you know, did he go to con's side here suddenly? It leaves you with a little bit of doubt if you're not really into the episode and the characters. This Side of Paradise, that's a great, great episode. Uh, you know, where we get to see Spock acting a little different. Yeah, there's a great scene in the transporter room after Layla has beamed up to the ship. She doesn't realize that Spock uh, has gotten rid of the spores yet. And Spock gives that, you know, that speech that he gives there at the end talking about if there's a hell and mine's no worse than anybody else's. But it's, it, the camera's on her face which gave you a really different read in that episode. At least it did to me. You could see the acting in her face. Yeah, and I, I thought that was, I mean, just looking at her, it was, I don't know, intense isn't the right word, but just, um, it just felt intense. It did feel intense. Maybe. Yeah, I agree. How about uh, the scenes from The Devil in the Dark? Devil in the Dark. Shatner's talked yes. about this being a really personal episode he remembers what happened on that episode well because it's when he was told his his father had passed away and he had to take off a number of days and so they had scenes or deleted scenes where his stand-in would take his place and you actually hear his stand-in delivering the lines to McCoy or to Spock again a little jarring a little different it's neat to see yeah. it but it's yes. like whoa I didn't expect that yeah, and I, I didn't even know, you know, his dad died during that episode, and it was kind of neat, him talking about how he had like six hours to shoot before he could get, catch the plane to, I think Florida, um, for the funeral, and how Nimoy and uh, the, one of the cameramen, Finnerman, I think is his name, mm -hmm. um, was helping him get through the shooting, and just he couldn't focus, and they, if it wasn't for them. You know, it probably would have been a total loss of, uh, you know, a shoot for that day. Right, right. He just decided to stay in work rather than go sit in his home or the airport for six hours. Right. Let's talk about City on the Edge of Forever. Obviously one of the best, or if not the best, episode from the original series. There is a touching, touching scene between Kirk and Edith Keeler on oh, yeah. the steps where they really open up to each other and they talk about what it, what it means to fall for each other and to fall in love. Oh my God. I can't believe that was cut. I know that it just, and the acting and, you know, between the two was phenomenal. I mean, she's saying that she, she fell, she did fall. And Kirk's like, no, you, you know, you didn't fall really. He didn't say that, but, and she goes, no, I mean, I fell for you. And right. I've like, wow. fallen for you, Mr. Kirk, she says. Right. Awesome stuff. I, I, I can only guess that it was cut because of time, because that's a really touching scene. And if you like that episode, man, this collection is worth it just for that, just for that scene. Oh, yeah. Very, very nice. And then they shot the truck actually hitting Edith Keeler. Wow. Right. That was a surprise to see. And, and I'm actually glad that the edit choices left that out because it's so much more impactful the way the finished product aired. Don't you think so? Yeah. To yeah. actually see her, you know, it was a wide shot. You see the truck kind of come in and bump her. And, um, going to the tight shot of Kirk holding on to McCoy 
Wow, that's so much more impactful. Yes. Want to go to Operation Annihilate? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, there's a couple of neat scenes there. The first, obviously, is Spock. He's already infected, checking in with the bridge. There's two scenes like that. And you can see Nimoy um, trying to portray the pain. Little gasps, you know, as he's yes. calling Kirk and checking in. And saying he has a sample. Yeah. And it's on him. Yeah, and, yeah right. But maybe the, the coolest part about this and, and I've seen a picture of this, and I forget where, of young Peter Kirk, his, uh, Kirk's nephew, sitting on the, on the bridge in his captain's chair with a uniform on. Now, I've seen the black and white, and I always just assumed that it was a promotional still, you know, made for the series. But they actually filmed a scene with Peter Kirk, yeah. and they talk about... You know, and he says, do you like these folks you're going to go live with? And he says, ah, they're not mom and dad. And then basically Kirk says, well, I'll see you later. <laughs> well, he, he, <laughs> and he has a security yeah. guy escort him to the transporter room. Yeah, it, 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 was, it, was, it wasn't it was that cold, but then it turned cold like instantly. <laughs> yeah, he goes yeah, back to business right away. Transporter. Right. <laughs> but, you know, and then they, they try to say, uh, they try to soften it a little bit because he says something like, well, I hope he doesn't join the academy. You know, he's talking to Scotty. Because he may have to make a decision like I've had to make. But I did think, wow, that was really uneven. And again, I see why it was cut. Yes. I didn't know that scene. I didn't really get. Why would they have a miniature um, uniform? Right. <laughs> for a kid. I, right. Clearly, clearly it made sense on the, on the page when it was written. But when they saw it, they must have went. Yeah, uh-uh, no, he wouldn't be wearing that. And I don't think, yeah, Kirk just kissed him off, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our guy's tough, but he's not that tough. Yeah, it was an interesting background into Kirk and his family, because you never really knew that. Right. Um, but, yeah, th that probably was better left out. Um, the episode Metamorphosis, that's where we, uh, you know, got to meet Zephyrin Cochran for the first time as the Galileos crashed on a planet with Kirk, Spock, and uh, Commissioner Hedford. Uh, there are some deleted scenes in there, uh, you know, messing with the creature while they're in the house that we never saw before, and a scene behind the, um, behind the shuttle with Spock and uh, Commissioner Hedford. But I want to talk about Eleanor Donahue, the actress who played Hedford. I want to talk about how she delivered lines to Kirk. Yeah. Um, you know, as the companion, as the companion. Yes. And it's funny, too, because she explains in the documentary that Shatner asked me to do this. And she said, for me, it kind of made sense because later on, you know, Hedford and the companion become one. So for me, it was really natural to read these lines. And she said it not only helped Shatner, it helped me get into the character later on then. Yes. Really cool. It was really kind of neat the way they did that. I liked that a lot. I thought that was worth mentioning. All right, here comes an episode. It's one of my favorites, Who Mourns for Adonais. Uh, some really cool behind-the-scenes stuff that you get to see. You get to see Apollo when he grows really big up against the blue screen, and they kind of show you how that was done. In um, one shot. In one shot, yeah. Uh, there's a nice uh, deleted scene of Leslie Parrish, who plays Caroline Palamas, and there's a big wind machine blowing her all over the set. <laughs> um, that was kind of interesting. I don't want to say any more about this episode yet. So let's move on to Mirror Mirror instead. Yes. Did you like that little scene between Sulu and Chekhov? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that was... Um... Just a little deleted scene there. And it's a moment where, where Sulu, you know, because he's got the big scar and he's the security chief. And he's basically warning Chekhov, isn't he? He's kind of giving him yes. a, a little, hey, you just better watch yourself, pal. Right. And then he, you know, emphasizes it with, you know, whatever his rank was, I forget, Ensign or yes. whatever. Yes, he kind of <laughs> emphasized that. You better settle down, buddy. Um, there were some, uh, for the episode, The Trouble with Tribbles, there was some omitted dialogue I mean, no, nothing major there, I didn't think. Uh, some triple test shots. 
uh, an alternative take in the bar, you know, that sounded a little bit different. Right. It, it, the show's supposed to be on the more comedic side and that you'll hear it in the, the, um, the documentary, but it, the way it came across, it made it more dramatic. Mm -hmm. and they, and so they decided to cut it for that reason. Yep. Yep. The episode returned to tomorrow. That's the episode where we get to meet Sargon and, um, you know, basically it's the one with the big white basketballs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought this was cool. First of all, the speech that Kirk gives in that episode, you know, risk is our business. It's always one of my, been one of my favorite speeches. I love that. Yes. It, it is a classic Kirk moment. It tells you who Kirk is. It tells you what the show's about. It's great. So there's an expanded version of that speech. So me being a Kirk fan, I just ate that up. I thought that was the best. I must have watched that three times. All right, let's talk about the other. There's another deleted scene where Spock is mind melding with one of the spheres, but it was cut. And unfortunately, they, they, have, um, they didn't have the audio saved anymore, but obviously they had the, the lines that they gave us in the documentary. But I thought that was neat, too, that he actually mind melded with one of them. Near the end, on, on disc three, then there's a, it's not really a documentary, it's a collection of snippets, snippets from the cutting room floor, it's called. And I just wanted to walk a, through a couple of these real quick. From Conscience of the King, and there's a wonderful scene where they're kind of flirting with each other and then a nice long kiss, something different than what we saw in the finished episode. Uh, Return of the Archons. I always remember how the people in the city streets moved and they moved sort of very slow and very deliberate as if they're, you know, animatronic almost. And then in this collection, we get to see why, because they had a big drum and they beat the drum. <laughs> boom, boom, the, boom. And they, the rhythm. And they stepped rhythm. and they moved. Yes. To that, to that drum beat. I thought that was really a neat way to do that. Wolf in the Fold, though, I thought this was a really cool scene with Kirk, McCoy, and Scotty kind of having a drink, <laughs> watching the dancer, and they start talking about Spock. Like you might do with a group of friends when one isn't there. <laughs> McCoy ends the scene by saying, yes, yeah, Spock could use a drink and lighten up a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like that. I mm, thought that was I funny. I did, too. There's a nice scene from Return to Tomorrow again where the three spheres are in sickbay. And McCoy is, McCoy is talking to them. It's when Kirk, Spock, and um, the female doctor, they're in the spheres. Their consciousness are in the, the spheres now because they've changed. And Kirk or McCoy is talking to them as if they were in the room listening. <laughs> and I thought that was a great McCoy moment. I wish I would have seen that in a finished episode. That would have been good. Yeah, yeah. How about the uh, scene from Elon of Troyes? The deleted scene in the rec room? First of all, do you remember the rec room ever looking like that? No. It was big, and it had plants, and there were a ton of people in there. Like, we've never, we've never seen the rec room look like that. Um, no, it's always been a small, relatively small room. Yeah, with yeah. With low ceilings and... And uh, Spock and Uhura were talking about the Vulcan harp. But it was just neat because they set up this entire new set that we've never seen. And then we don't get to see it. <laughs> Until now, 50 yeah. years later. That's too bad. And then I just wanted to mention this real quick, Paradise Syndrome. There's a speech, you know, we kind of remember, if you remember that show, there's a moment where uh, she is saying to Kirk, well, you know, you're a god. And uh, in this deleted scene, Kirk is coming back saying, I'm not a god. I'm not a god. I'm not a god. He says it like three times in this 30-second speech, you know. Yeah. And again, you're watching that going, yeah, I see why that was cut. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a weird presentation there. Perhaps one of the most important evidence of how this show evolved and kept evolving um, was some of the omitted dialogue from the episode, Who Mourns for Adonais? Uh, in episode 11 of our 70s Trek, we talked about how James Blish often would receive the first draft of scripts 
to use as a basis of his adaptations. Uh, of course, Blish and his wife wrote the 11 Star Trek novelizations of the original episodes. So the aired episode ends with Kirk saying, would it hurt us if, would it hurt us, I wonder, just to have gathered a few laurel leaves and the episode or the Enterprise leaves orbit? But it's different in Blish's book. Here's how he writes it in the book. Um, McCoy enters the bridge and Kirk turns to him. He says, yes, Bones, somebody ill. And he says, Carolyn Palamas rejected her breakfast this morning. And Kirk says, something going around? And McCoy says, she's pregnant, Jim. I just examined her. What? You heard me. And Kirk looks at McCoy and says, Apollo? And Bones says, yes. Kirk says, Bones, is that possible? And McCoy leans an arm on the hood of the computer, turns to Spock, and he says, Spock, can I put a question to this gadget of yours? I'd like to ask it if I'm to turn my sickbay into a delivery room for a human child or a god. My medical courses did not include obstetrics for infant gods. So Star Trek VII, the James Blush uh, novelization, ends with Carolyn being pregnant. What's really fascinating is everybody just sort of thought, well, that was a really early draft or Blish made it up. But here in this, here in this collection, yeah, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. So yeah, the kicker here is there's recovered footage that they actually shot Spock reacting to a voice reading, um, reading lines off camera. Uh, And part of it is it's not there, but, Essentially, the voice reads exactly the dialogue um, that that Bob just read. Yeah. Carolyn Palamas was pregnant. I mean, think of it. And that idea not only made it into a first draft or second draft script, it made it into a final draft script that went to the set and it was shot. Incredible. Not, uh, Not including it, though. What do you think? Do you think maybe that was... NBC sensors yeah. that maybe cut it. I think you're right. I think it was the NBC sensors cutting it out. Very fascinating, though. That's a real big piece of evidence of how the shows evolved because of the sensors, because of decisions made in the editing room. I really thought that was pretty cool. I thought it was, too. Hey, that wraps up our look at the Roddenberry Vault. Next week... We'll look at Gene Roddenberry's return to Paramount in 1975. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening to 70s Trek, an independent fan production. Join us next week as we explore more about the production, the actors, the producers, and the influencers of Star Trek in the lost decade of the 1970s on 70s Trek.